Episode 162 of CPP Cast with guest Colin Hirsch, recorded August 8th, 2018. This episode of CPP Cast is sponsored by Backtrace, the turnkey debugging platform that helps you spend less time debugging and more time building. Get to the root cause quickly with detailed information at your fingertips. Start your free trial at backtrace.io slash cppcast. In this episode, we discuss the CPPCon 2018 program. Then we talk to Colin Hirsch. Colin talks to us about the art of C++ libraries, including PegTool, JSON, and more. Welcome to episode 162 of CBP Cast, the first podcast for C++ developers by C++ developers. I am your host, Rob Irving, joined by my co-host, Jason Turner. Jason, how are you doing today? I'm all right, Rob. How are you doing? I'm doing okay. You know, weather's not too bad over here in North Carolina. How about you? Oh, uh, cool morning for me. I'm actually wearing a sweatshirt at the moment, but... Very nice, very nice. Cooler than the rest of the planet. <laughs> <laughs> Any uh, news you wanted to bring up before we get going? Uh, no, I don't think so. Not at the moment. Okay. Well, at the top of our episode, I'd like to read a piece of feedback. Uh, this week, we got a tweet from Paul saying, I feel like I'm cheating on CPP cast with Lambda cast, but it is so good. Uh, I had not heard of Lambda cast, but I looked them up. Um, they're about 20 episodes in. And they seem to be a functional programming focused podcast. So, sounds well, interesting. Yeah, that's a completely different beast from what we're doing i think yeah i wouldn't say you're cheating on on us with them and if you you were (laughs) cheating on us then you know you shouldn't let us know about it maybe (laughs) (laughs) uh but yeah it's always great to have more uh technical programming podcasts out there so we're happy to hear about lambda cast and you can go check them out if you're interested uh so we'd love to hear your thoughts about the show as well uh you can always reach out to us on facebook twitter or email us at feedback at cpcast.com and don't forget to leave us a review on itunes joining us today is dr colin hirsch uh dr hirsch studied computer science at the university of technology in aachen germany in 93 and later got a phd in mathematics from the same university he worked for two years as a consultant for t-mobile developing back-end server applications in c++ and lua Later, Colin moved to Italy, opened his own business, and continued working for T-Mobile, now Deutsche Telekom, as well as working for some other interesting projects like Greenpeace and the Austrian Ministry of Ecology. In his free time, he enjoys photography, being in nature, science fiction, and spending time with his daughter. Uh, Colin, welcome to the show. Yeah, thank you, and I'm um, very glad to be here with you today. <laughs> Thanks for joining us. You know, I... I wondered if uh, T-Mobile was headquartered in Aachen, because I noticed that as an American with T-Mobile service, I had the best out- service outside of the United States I've ever had when I was last in Aachen. <laughs> <laughs> no, they, their headquarters is actually in, in Bonn, Germany, but that's just like an hour, an hour and a half from Aachen. So sort of same region, same general area. Okay. Makes sense. So yeah, 93, that was, um, you've been programming for a while then, I take it. Uh, yes, I started pretty early, actually. When I was um, 10 years old, I got my first computer, even though wow. most people looking at it uh, mistook it for a calculator because that was the, the size of the thing. But it did actually have a very small alphanumeric display and you could write uh, programs in BASIC as long as you stayed within the 524 bytes of free memory that was. so. What kind of computer was that? What was that? Uh, it was a Casio PB110. Okay. Uh, you've probably never heard of it before. And uh, I once looked up the tech specs, and it was fun to see there was actually a 4-bit microprocessor in there. So, Yeah, I Jason, think... Are, I, are you checking to see if you have one on your desk or something? No, I don't. I have something <laughs> similar-ish. Um, this is a Casio FX4000P, which was the first programmable calculator that I had. And I think it also is a 4-bit microprocessor in it. Yeah, it might have been the same thing, just sort of packaged into a different form factor. Perhaps. <laughs> Interesting. 
Of course, 1993, we were a bit further along the road, although it was sort of the, the fun times, you know, compiling your own Linux kernels with experimental compilers and, and that kind of thing. Right. Right. Okay, well, Colin, we have a couple of news articles to discuss. Uh, feel free to comment on any of these, and then we'll start talking to you more about uh, the libraries you work on, okay? Okay, great. That sounds fine. Okay, so this first one is that uh, Google has open-sourced Filament, which is a physically-based rendering engine for Android, Windows, Linux, and Mac OS. Um, I had not heard about this before, but I, I guess it was an internal... Google project before, and, and they released this out to the wild. Yeah, I, I mean, the pictures look pretty, but I feel like I'm at a loss of context for this. Like, is it intended for just Video static ray tracing? Or, yeah, yeah, games. Or I um, with the building modeling energy simulation stuff that I've done in the past, there are ray tracers that are used for, like, actually um, these physically based ray tracers used for things like determining how much light you'll actually have in a room on a given day of the year based on the reflectivity of the wall colors and that kind of thing. Like, is that what this is intended for? Is it intended for like actual physics modeling? I don't know. Given I, that I, I was didn't. also a bit confused about yeah. like, is it, is it for real time or is it something where each picture takes, you know, like two hours on a high end uh, computer, um, which also shows that I'm not particularly into computer graphics lately, but yeah. <laughs> Right. But given that it's, you know, the first platform they mention is Android, does that kind of imply that it might be for... Oh, it does say real-time physically based rendering. Ah, uh, okay. Real-time. Yeah. Thanks. I would think it's real-time if, if you're running it on a phone. <laughs> hey, you yeah, never that's know. that's a good point. Yeah. Well, it looks like an interesting project. I, I definitely recommend everyone to, to look at some of these uh, screenshots being produced with the library. They're pretty impressive looking. Yeah. Uh, next, we have the entire CppCon 2018 schedule is now available. And that is only seven weeks away now, right, Jason? <sighs> yes, right at seven weeks, it seems. And it looks like five, six, seven different tracks, depending on what particular hour of the day you're looking at. Yeah. At yeah, least like six tracks. Seven. Yeah. Now, one question I had was, I know they've already announced at least some of the keynotes and plenaries, but all of the keynote and plenary time slots say TBA. And yes. I wasn't sure why that might be. Um, They've already announced them. They just need to decide who goes when. Because I know yeah, we, got, they, we have Kate Gregory doing one. Um, we have that guy, I can't remember his name, but he works on the video game graphics, I believe, or movie graphics. Mark Elnt. Yeah. Elnt. Yeah, I believe yeah. that he's doing Chandler. One. Chandler's doing one. See, I don't, I don't know why these aren't just listed on schedule. Well, that's an interesting point because that's one, two, three, and then it's kind of implied. Well, it is even actually said here. Herb and Bjarne will be speakers. That's five. That's basically everyone. Yeah, I mean, maybe they're just shuffling around who's going where. I don't know. Oh. They also have all these open content sessions that are listed as TBA. Yes, they haven't even announced the call for open content sessions yet. How many of those did they do last year? I know we we talked about um, the jewel bots with Sarah, and she she gave an open content. Was that the only one last year? No, uh, there tends to be. Well, uh, the morning and noon hour of every day is what I would have expected. It looks like this year there's also some open in the evening. I don't know if they did that last year, and I just wasn't paying attention. Okay. But pretty much anyone can submit that. So if you are going to be at CBPCon and you haven't yet, uh, and you're not giving a talk, or even if you are giving a talk and you've got some other thing that you want to propose as a talk that um, doesn't go through the normal review process, basically you would just you have the ability to just give something during one of the non-normal mainstream times, um, then they'll announce that probably pretty soon for you to submit talks for that. Yeah, and these open content talks, like you said, they're kind of all, you know, not going to interfere with session time. So there's one at 8 a.m., one during at 1230, which is kind of the lunch hour. And there's one uh, at night kind of at the same time as possible lightning talks. Yeah. Uh, Colin, are you going to CPPCon? 
Uh, no, unfortunately, I will not be making it. But um, I have to say the, the program is quite impressive. And I think we could do two of these uh, CPP cast sessions just going over it in more <laughs> no. detail. And I will definitely um, try to get to some major CPP conference next year. Even though sitting here in Europe, it might be one of the other ones. So I'll see about that, definitely. Well, Jason, you were at meeting C++ last year, and that was quite a good conference for you, right? Yes, although unfortunately I was only able to attend two days of it due to Air Berlin going out of business, and I had to rearrange my flight schedule. <laughs> <laughs> it happens. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, uh, next thing, the C++ Foundation Developer Survey. Uh, yeah, so this is out there. Go ahead, Jason. I was going to say, they did one of these about six months ago. Yes. So this is a follow-up. They just apparently want to keep surveying the community to see how you're using C++. This one seems to be related to the cloud. Okay, I, I haven't looked it's a good idea yet. there. Okay. They they started off uh, the the first one. I, I think I participated. They sort of covered all the basics, and I get, it looks like they're sort of choosing one subject at a time, and we'll just dig into it. And I think that's a pretty good idea to um, get some more feedback. I just hope that enough people participate so that it gives a sort of reasonably representative um, analysis and data on, on on the situation of of as many C plus plus developers as possible. Yeah, and it looked like the information they got, like you said last uh, last time, was pretty valuable. And I could see them even doing the same surveys every 18 or 24 months just to see how the landscape is changing as well. That's true. I, I would, however, both be uh, interested in knowing why cloud was chosen now for the first uh, subject-dedicated survey. So I'll be looking forward to see the results. and um, So not just the survey results, but also what they actually make of it and, and what will happen next in the C++ committee and related areas. Yeah. yeah well, listeners should definitely uh, check out the survey. It should only take a few minutes to uh, get your your results in, right? Mm -hmm. And then the last thing, uh, we've talked to Phil Nash before about his conference that he's starting, the C++ on the C conference. And if you're interested in going to that, early bird tickets are now available. Yes, and I think an important note here, as Phil has explicitly said, is that if you have submitted a talk and you are waiting to hear whether or not it has been accepted, you do not need to rush out and buy the early bird ticket because you will still be uh, eligible for early bird even if the announce the uh, notifications are late mm. for your talk submission. That's that's a good good thing for him to do. And early bird ticket says is until September 9th. You can get the yes. early bird price. Okay. So that's one pretty close to you to consider going to, Colin, if you're looking for a... Yes, it is, actually. I definitely will check my calendar for February after we finish uh, here, and that might be a good place for me to go, yes. And, you know, in southern England in February, you'll cool off even if it's a bit too late compared to now. <laughs> yes, definitely. I've, I've been to southern England uh, often. I have uh, grandparents there, actually. Well, I used to have grandparents there, so I'd be looking forward to going there again. Uh, I only have, well, I, I've been to Southern England twice, but it's been, oh goodness, make me feel old. Like 20 years since I was last there. 22 years. Yeah. Okay. Well, Colin, where should we start? Um, you, I believe, are the main, main contributor to the Art of C++, which is available on github.com at tauCPP. Do you want to tell us a bit about it? Um, yeah, so we're actually, we're mostly two people working on this uh, sort of collection, small collection of C++ libraries, the other being Daniel Frey, with uh, whom I uh, spent some time at uh, university in Aachen, where we met. And we've also spent some time working together in our professional jobs. And now we've got this um, this project running. And it's very much uh, a collaboration be be between the two of us. And um, the collection is sort of rather uh, mixed. We've got some things that Daniel had on his hard disk uh, for, for a while and then just wanted to sort of share with the world. And then we've got um, now two major libraries, I'd say, that uh, one of which has been going since uh, 2007. That's when, when I started the PEGTL. And... Basically, Daniel wanted sort of an, an, an umbrella under which we could sort of gather all of our open source efforts and uh, put them up in, in one place and let them live there and be worked on. 
And the nice thing is we've also gathered a third person now, who um, Julian from Brazil, I believe, and he's helping us with the um, CMake, with some CMake related things and also the, the Conan packaging. So this is, of course, a very um, nice uh, milestone for an open source project when you suddenly have other people contributing and, and chiming in and, and helping you uh, get on with things. So we're quite happy with the way things are going, even though being a library or a collection of libraries only developed in our free time, development is sometimes slow since obviously we can't always dedicate all of our free time to it. But uh, we like the direction it's going in and we are generally happy with, with what's happening there. You know, starting a, uh, talking about the beginning of the project, and you said basically Daniel had some work on his hard drive that he wanted to share, and this concept of you know basically letting the internet be your backup. <laughs> <that's>, <laughs> I don't know, it's just kind of funny. I think that was something that Linus basically said when he started Linux, so maybe you're off to a good start here. Yeah, I, I'm not quite sure whether the, the backup aspect was the, impo was the important one, but it's right. definitely a, a good side effect of things. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> So uh, specifically, you mentioned first the PEGTOL, as I think that's how you pronounced it, P-E-G-T-L library. Do you want to talk about that? And then we'll dig into some of the others. Yes, I think the, the PEGTL library is sort of um, very typical for how um, the things uh, with our open source efforts got, got started. It was like I, I had stumbled over a library called Yard by, by Christopher Diggins, which was a, a small parser library he had written. And he was sort of trying out the idea, what happens if you write a parser combinator library and you use C++ templates and template instantiations as your domain-specific languages, or okay. as your domain-specific language to, to express the grammar in language, in the C++ language. So... Um, you, your combinators are, are classes, and to combine them, you, you write down template instantiations in your source code. So the, the syntax is obviously very different compared to something like, you know, the normal EBNF or whatever we use for grammars. But uh, the nice thing is that you don't need a preprocessor, and, and you can just put it into, into your source code, into your C++ source. And... The question that, that I asked then was, um, okay, so this Yard library is still pre-C++11, so pre-variated templates. And this means that he had to go through all the, you know, the, the, the hoops, he had to jump through all the hoops to um, make the um, templates such that they could accept a certain number of arguments, but you could also use them with less if you wanted to. But there was always an upper limit, and it always made the code more complicated than necessary. And in 2007, we already had, you know, like GCC 4.3, I believe it was, and that had support for variety templates. And so I sort of took the idea and just re-implemented it in C++ 11, or at least in the part of C++ 11 available at the time with the variety templates. And it turned out that that made many things very much easier. And from that point onward, the project sort of took on a life on its own. I then um, made uh, an input layer that was a bit more flexible than, than the original Yard library. And uh, I, I wrote um, documentation and um, I didn't bake the semantic actions into the library, but rather just added a mechanism by which semantic actions could be added to a grammar by the user. And yeah, so the rest is history. And uh, one interesting or funny tidbit of history is that the first version that I put up on, um, on Google code hosting at the time actually carries the version number 0 0.9. And uh, the interesting thing is I fully expected the next version, like three weeks later, to be 1.0. Mm -hmm. And that obviously didn't quite work out as intended <laughs> as we went through several years until we arrived at like 0 0.32. And then it took another few years before Daniel and I together uh, took on the job of uh, major refactoring that then culminated in version 1.0. <laughs> That's funny. I... 
think I, I love things personally to be lexicographically sortable. Like I use ISO date format anywhere I can. Makes me wonder if maybe we should start our first project as like 0.00.0. So then we can make sure it's sortable from there on out. <laughs> But I'm looking at the examples on GitHub here, and it is definitely a uh, technique um, that I have not, I think, seen before. So you basically have struct integer colon, so now you're deriving from something, and you've got a sequence, which is an optional with one plus or minus, and then um, one or more digits, it looks like, and then you you've, you basically create an integer parser in a single line of with a bunch of inheritance, basically. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. We're sort of constrained by the C++ uh, com- template um, syntax here. So in, a, in an EBNF, you would have the digit followed by the symbol plus. And here we just have to write plus uh, with digit as a, as a template parameter. And one of the first questions we then always get asked is, what, why do we derive? Why do we write struct integer? Why don't we use a type def or a using to give a new name to this particular template instantiation? And the answer is that in the error reporting, it's um, usually a good idea to, to use struct because then you get an error parsing integer instead of an error parsing seq, eq, right. opt1, etc., etc. That's interesting because that could also help potentially with compile times because the length of the identifier that the compiler is passing around is smaller, the type that is. And in some cases, from some of the stuff I've seen, like from Joe, Joe Falcu about compile time optimization. But okay, uh, that's an interesting aspect. We, we do generally try to do some optimizations for compile time, but the length of identifiers hasn't been an explicit goal of us so far. It's the aggregate size of the uh, symbol table seems to have some impact on compile time. And if you can keep it smaller, then so that might be helping anyhow. I don't know. I'm not definitely not an expert in that. But um, yeah, so I've, I've never seen a technique like this, though. Did you have you considered going the route that like uh, Boost Spirit uses with expression templates to accomplish a simpler, similar thing? Um. After all these years, we've basically gotten used to to this approach, and we also um, like that we give the compiler the burden, basically, of of optimizing our grammar. And um, we also, once you sort of take this step away from the the C++ operators, you you and you have the words you aren't sort of constrained by anything we we have if you look at the um the the rules reference we've got really tons of of different combinators that make it easier to to write grammars because like uh if you want a comma separated list of space separated items there's already a, a combinator for that and and you can use that out of the box just just want to wow. take a step back what are some of the use cases of a parsing expression grammar that you might use this library for well, we've used it for some smaller DSLs uh, for config parsing. And one of the major use cases is also the Tau CPP JSON library that has a PECTL based parser. Even though there we, we went a bit beyond what the PECTL offers and uh, have some a- additional optimizations in there, which, however, also shows that the PECTL is very open and modular. So it's very easy to say, uh, at this point, in this particular point, I want something special, uh, either semantically or from a performance point of view, and you can just add it and uh, it will work together with all the rest without any big glue code or whatever. So you just have to add her to certain um, API guidelines and then you can just plug it all together. Well, so now you, you've mentioned the JSON library, um, and it sounds like it's a pretty good use case for PEGTL. Uh, what kind of compile times do, are you getting with JSON since you said that you, uh, you've tried to optimize compile time somewhat? How does it look? Um, I we haven't really got any benchmarks for compile time. It's just okay. that we occasionally we, we look at how things are going. And um, in the PECTL in particular, we look at reducing template instantiation depth since you have uh, tons of nested templates. Um, we we tried that within the pegtail we don't have like uh, ten la- additional layers for every single user visible layer in the grammar, um, 
but we we don't benchmark that it's it's not so bad in practice so that's where we hand waving but that's the best i've got here no that, i mean that makes actually a lot of sense if 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 the compile times were bad then you would say well we do get a lot of complaints from our users about compile times and you didn't say that so it must be okay <laughs> Yeah, either users are, have a thick skin or computers are really fast <laughs> nowadays. And we also, I think somewhere, somewhere in the documentation, we recommend sticking PECTL grammars into a C file rather than in a header file so that it will be compiled only once in every project. And um, also that sometimes won't be possible, but a small hint that can help people to, to keep the compile time a bit lower. Right. So how do you go about ensuring that uh, your projects stay high quality? Um, well, that's a very big question, and I could probably talk an hour about it. Uh, but I think one of the main parts is just that um, we take a lot of time for things. So sometimes when there's a change, you see a change on GitHub, or you see an additional feature pop up on GitHub, what you don't see is that we might have discussed that for three weeks playing ping pong with ideas until we are happy with the result. Um, so this is yeah time together with, uh, you know, gut feeling and just uh, working together and trying to um, leverage sort of all of our experiences of our joint experiences and not just having one person working on complicated parts. Uh, then, of course, we've got sort of the, the usual stuff. We've got uh, a large test suite, in particular for the PECTL, which yeah, as an 11-year-old project is pretty mature, and we've got uh, full test coverage, and we've uh, spent a lot of time on that too. And then there are also some parts um, that that are interesting because they come sort of from, from actually putting it up as open source. Like... If, if I imagine I'd have written the pact here just for my personal use, I'd have the code, I'd have the tests, but I probably wouldn't have that much documentation for my own library, for my own personal use. But since we are trying to, to reach a large audience, we are also investing a lot of time in the documentation. And sometimes you just come to a point where you are writing the documentation and you think, well, this, this shouldn't be so complicated. Why, why is this, why is this so hard to explain? And even then we go back and look at the API and uh, look at the, the complexity and whether we can change it in, in, in a way, which for us is also a part of quality. So quality is ease of use and understandability, as well as simplicity of implementation and test coverage and, well, of course, correct code, as, as correct as possible. Okay, so uh, you said that you have full test coverage with PEGTL. Yeah, at least we, we think we have. It's of course not quite so easy to measure with a with a template library where we have uh, where basically all the code is is a template. But we do sometimes just uh, look into the the coverage analysis and check that um, all all lines are actually covered, all lines of the core library. Okay. Yeah, I was wondering about that since it is a template library. There's virtually an infinite number of ways that people could use your library, right? Yes. That, of course, um, make, makes it hard. And, and we, we know full well that 100% test coverage isn't always as great as it sounds. Mm -hmm. But um, we do try when writing tests to sort of not just cover obvious cases, but also go a bit left and right and, and test some combinations, some, some weird stuff and, and things. And we are quite... Um, we're quite happy with the results because it very rarely happens that some user comes up and says, yeah, we found a real bug here. You need to fix this. So it seems to be an appropriate testing approach for this kind of library. Okay. And also one thing that helps us is that it's, uh, it's very small. Like the, the core of the Pectia library is like 6,000 lines of code. Okay. So it's uh, we, we try to keep things small or lean and mean, as we say, and that, of course, also makes it much easier to get something like 100% test coverage, at least on the on the lines of code, compared to some you know 100,000 lines of code right. behemoth. I'm also curious, since it, it, it sounded a, a lot like your uh, collaboration with Daniel and the other contributors, that... Um, 
or that the, con- the collaboration is very important to maintaining high code quality for you. And I'm curious if you have any recommendations for how that works out or tools that you use to for how you communicate ideas while you're developing the next new feature. Um, I don't really think that tooling is a particularly important part of the equation, at least not for such a small team with mostly just two people writing the code. So we use everything from Skype to emails and, and share documents. Okay. But um, I, I have actually been, been thinking about this on occasion. And I think the main part is that we are very detached from our ideas. So it's like if one of us has an idea and, and suggests, makes a suggestion or shows the code to the other one and the other one then says, yeah, no, this is not good. We have to change it that way, then it's better. We, we iterate very fast in a fast fashion together without trying to get uh, or trying to not get hung up on our own ideas just because they're our own ideas. So we, we fully um, embrace the fact that the first iteration or even the second or third iteration of any code of regardless of how brilliant the programmer might not be the best and that we have to just go on and look at it again and sleep over it and, 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 you know, spend another week perhaps thinking if it's, if it's something difficult and then we'll just um, talk about it again and we'll go on with that until we are both happy and the result looks sort of as small and elegant as seems possible at the time. And um, yes, I, th- I sometimes think it's a bit of a shame that this is not really visible on the, on the GitHub repository because you, you know we can't just uh, paste all discussions on there. But it is definitely an important part of the of the development process for us. All right. Uh, so my recommendation is to yeah just collaborate closely and um, share ideas freely. Just talk about things. That helps a lot. I wanted to interrupt this discussion for just a moment to bring you a word from our sponsors. Backtrace is a debugging platform that improves software quality, reliability, and support by bringing deep introspection and automation throughout the software error lifecycle. Spend less time debugging and reduce your mean time to resolution by using the first and only platform to combine symbolic debugging, error aggregation, and state analysis. At the time of error, Backtrace jumps into action, capturing detailed dumps of application and environmental state. Backtrace then performs automated analysis on process memory and executable code to classify errors and highlight important signals such as heap corruption, malware, and much more. This data is aggregated and archived in a centralized object store, providing your team a single system to investigate errors across your environments. Join industry leaders like Fastly, Message Systems, and AppNexus that use Backtrace to modernize their debugging infrastructure. It's free to try, minutes to set up, fully featured with no commitment necessary. Check them out at backtrace.io slash cppcast. Uh, most of the projects seem to be listed as C++ 11. Do you have any plans to update them to C++ 14, 17? Are you looking at anything in C++ 20? Um, yeah, that's a subject that we've been starting to look into recently. Um, now, there, there are some sort of differences between the individual projects, like the PEGTL uh, seems to work very well with C++11. There are only few places where it would really benefit from jumping to 14 or 17. So we'll try to leave it on C++11 as long as possible. Um, one reason for that is also that we, we know from personal experience and anecdotal evidence from, you know, what you read on the web or speaking to other friends in the, in the IT sector that some companies are really very slow in updating compilers and some even some of my close friends are still stuck on C++ 98 and for them even C++ 11 would be a great and important improvement so in the name of wanting to reach um, an as large audience as possible we are sort of dragging our feet a little bit on that front but we have also seen that uh, the JSON library for example would probably benefit much more from going to C++14 or C++17. And since we are still, even after three years, um, at a pre-1.0 point, the possibility is is absolutely there that we will launch it as C++14 or 17 library and we'll do all the cleanups and simplifications that are possibly, uh, that can possibly be done by jumping to these newer standards. So we are trying to keep an, an 
open eye in both directions, future and past, and then gauge what uh, where, where the best sort of cost benefit is or where the most benefit can, can be reached without cutting off too many people. Out of curiosity, what um, standards or compilers are you able to use at work? Um, well, that changes a lot. One of the compilers I'm using um, a lot at the moment is actually GCC 4.8. Okay. Um, and um, there are other things where I can use some newer compilers, but uh, yeah, we simply don't always have the possibility. And I mean, yeah, we, generic, we to just update to the latest compiler and use the latest standard. Right. Uh, yeah, I was just wondering if you were using 17 at work, if there, or for example, if there were particular features that you're like, oh, I would really like to use this feature in the JSON library, since you said that's the one that you thought could benefit the most. Yes, there are definitely some things like in, in the JSON library, we use string views, for example, mm. and those aren't available in C++11 yet. So we have our own fully baked string view implementation that is used as a fallback um, in, in the JSON library. And that would, of course, uh, be one great simplification if we could just cut that out and rely on the, on the standard implementation. Right. So I'm um, curious what compilers you support for these projects. We try to support as many compilers as possible. So if you look into the continuous integration config files of the PEGTL, you'll find um, many GCC versions, many Clang versions on both Linux and Mac OS. And we've also had some uh, community support and contributions to enable the PEGTL to work on Android and on Windows with both GCC and Visual Studio. So for 2018 landscape, I think we are covering all of the major bases and um, we are quite happy with that. Even though there is sometimes a bit of pain to support some particularly old or different compiler, but so far it's um, the, the effort of all involved parties to support the C++ standards better and better is showing. And we are hoping that the additional effort to support like Visual Studio uh, will become less over time. Yeah, I, I just, since you mentioned it, looked at your Travis configuration file and I don't think I've ever seen one quite so extensive. I believe you support basically every configuration that can be supported on Travis. Uh, yeah, that's that's entirely possible. In particular, Daniel has spent a lot of time in supporting as many platforms as possible, and also just different compiler versions. And it does that is also, of course, part of the equation uh, regarding quality. And it does mm. help us sometimes catch things early when some other compiler gives some other warning that we haven't taken into consideration yet. So with this many configurations, and for our listeners, it seems pretty much every version of GCC from 4.8 to 8, every version of Clang from 3.5 to 6, and every version of Xcode that's available on Travis, plus Android compilers. Yes, that's a lot of compilers. Um, yeah, that's just the Travis. Then we've also got the Doozer and the App Veyer for some other platforms. And we'll definitely have to talk about the Doozer because that's one I've I'm personally not familiar with, and I don't believe we've had any guests no, mention I don't it. Think we have. But I, I've I've had this problem. I'm curious if it's ever been a problem for you, where uh, an old compiler is giving a warning that a new compiler is not, and it turns out that the old compiler was not necessarily 100 percent correct. New compiler has bug fixes. Do you run into issues like that at all with this many configurations that you're trying to support? It does happen sometimes, but as I said, the, the overall pains of supporting that many platforms uh, aren't that big. We usually only have very few places where we need specific workarounds. We also try to run very clean code. We, we compile with minus pedantic and, and many warnings enabled. And... Yeah, it, it's not a big issue, at least not for these libraries. Obviously, it de might depend a bit on the kind of thing that you're doing. But for us, luckily, it hasn't been too bad so far. Okay, cool. And so we, we, we just we mentioned app, app, app there and Doozer then. Uh, so app there, it looks like you've got the last couple of versions of uh, Visual Studio plus MinGW compilers on here. Um, and we've talked about app there on previous shows, but let's talk about Doozer. 
What what is Doozer? It's basically another um, continuous integration uh, platform, and I have to admit that I'm personally also not all that familiar with it. I think Daniel uh, stumbled over it and then decided that it was a good idea to support it since it had some more, I believe it was some different Linux distributions available or something like that. So not exactly an area where we expected any compatibility issues, seeing that we aren't particularly tied to, to an operating system. But just in order to cover all the bases, uh, we tried it and we've got it working now. So we're happy to have even more platforms tested automatically. Yeah, um, it does look like it's uh, various distributions of Fedora and Ubuntu. Yes. So, and OS OS X. Um, is it also a free service then? I assume not something you're paying for or? Uh, no, all of the continuous integration services that we are using are free for, at least free for us as an open source project. Right. Very cool. Um, you also which, mentioned um, um, Conan support, and it looks like you directly work with Conan to expose uh, Pigtail as a Conan package. Is that right? Yes, we have recently been looking into uh, packaging, and since Conan seems to be one of the up-and-coming package managers for C++ libraries, we decided to, to look into it. And we also got some support from the community, uh, in particular uh, from, from Julian, our third Tau CPP member. And yeah, we are, we are happy to show up in as many package managers as, as possible, even though it is in a sense still uh, sort of a, a bit of a new subject for us. Like if you look into PEGTL packages for, for the different Linux distributions, you'll see that many of them are a bit out of date at this point. So we are still sort of in the, in the learning phase to see how, the, how to play together with the distributions or the package maintainers and who needs to push uh, whom, when, and trigger what uh, so that the, uh, yes, to keep everything a bit more up to date. But so yeah, we are, we are happy with how things are going. <laughs> been saying this a lot but yeah <laughs> <laughs> well that's good yeah it is it is but we've been uh, at least i've been mostly looking at pegtl and it seems like that's what we've been talking about the most but there's actually a lot of projects on here and you've mentioned the json library already but do you maintain the same level of continuous integration and quality across all of the libraries that you have up here um, we have been ramping up to the same level in the other libraries they might not all be there yet and um, some of the libraries are also so specialized that we don't really expect very many users of them, like the, the integer sequence and the tuple library isn't something that a normal user would use because uh, they'd use the, the standard implementation. So these are just some smaller, in a sense, more educational projects um, that, that Daniel put up into Tau CPP. But he is uh, pushing to get the same level of continuous integration coverage on that and yeah on all libraries it's like the where once you've got the first library running on all the platforms on all the continuous in, continuous integration platforms then you you know the quirks you know you get an idea of how to how to go about things and then it's just a matter of using the same config file and fixing all the bugs and all the warnings <laughs> and all the compilers which <laughs> right yeah I think this raises an interesting question, at least for me personally. Um, it seems like, like I, I, it would be interesting to me if there was some top level way in GitHub to say, well, this is the basic CMake, you know, warnings that I want to use and the basic Travis configuration that I want to use. But as far as I know, you're just going to have to copy and paste these things between projects whenever you update them. Is that? Uh, as far as you know, also, like, there's nowhere a way to centralize this across your organization? Uh, yes, that is actually an issue. There are several things that we would like to centralize. Um, in particular, if you look at the JSON library, it's got a full copy of the PEGTL embedded into oh. the source code. So we copied it into the JSON library. We changed all the namespaces so that there wouldn't be a collision if any application would were to use both the JSON and the PECTL library independent hmm. of each other. And we are yeah, we are looking for, for solutions to this and we are hoping that package management might be uh, might help us there. If we have a, a JSON package that depends on a PECTL package, then that could make things easier. Um, so 
for us, that's sort of the big question. The, the continuous integration config files aren't that large and don't change that often. Mm -hmm. So for us, it's more a question of, of reuse on a, on a higher level with, with regards to all the shared code um, between all the libraries. Now, I, I'm curious if you did consider already and then reject submodules for your Git projects. Yeah, I was wondering the same thing. Yeah, we've, we've looked at it and we've, we've tried it in a, in a private context somewhere else and we weren't sort of quite happy with it, even though I can't recall the exact issues now. So there's the Git submodules and then there's the other sub thingy. So there, there are actually two different ways of how to embed one Git repository into another. And we might try one of them, but it also seemed to be slightly awkward regarding how you then have one project within the other one and then the sub project still needs all its own configuration files and everything so what would be ideal would be some kind of truly hierarchical system where you can say uh, we've got the overarching project and then all the individual parts and this might of course be something that we could be able to realize with sub modules but we, we haven't actually tried it yet Okay. But this is actually one of the biggest issues that we're that we having at the moment, um, something that we, uh, we've been thinking about a lot, but um, haven't been able to dedicate enough time to actually go ahead and, and try something out yet. You know, uh, Rob, I hate to admit this, but this all sounds like a strong argument for doing the uh, you know single Git repository with all of the files in it, which we've talked about way, with... Uh... Google does. I think yeah. we talked about with Titus Winters. Yeah. Yeah. So we talked about it with Titus. I think the first time we had him on because it's it it does not make me comfortable, but I can see the issues that it would solve. Yeah. Yeah. The problem is, I think it, it solves some issues and then it creates some other ones. So yeah. You now we we have fifty libraries in one Git repository. Versioning might be a bit of a nightmare when. The development cycles aren't synced up. So I'm yeah, everything would have to be versioned at once. I guess that's what. Well, I mean, if you do the uh, live, live from head uh, mentality as well, where head is always stable, then I guess it's all. Then it then that matters less too. I don't. I don't know if that's a real solution for the average organization yeah. or not. Honestly, I'll I'll say I think sub modules works well as long as the project you're bringing in as a sub module isn't going to be updated that frequently like if it's already pretty stable hmm. then i think it makes sense yeah. well, that might be both a case for and against sub moduling <laughs> the pectl into the json library right. since it is both very stable but then again it does have a a lot of small changes updates and, and feature additions over time so yeah right. um Going back to package managers, we, we mentioned Conan. Have you looked into any of the other package managers, like VC package maybe? Um, I believe that VC package um, is something that somebody is already working on. Mm -hmm. uh, we've, I think we've already got a, at least a PECTL package there. It's definitely one of the package managers that we want to be in. And uh, if, if it uh, doesn't work out, we'll, we'll try to work on it ourselves. Of course, uh, the hope is that the community, that the general community will somehow standardize on, let's say, not too many different package managers, just not, as not to create too much overhead. Of course, yeah. that might or might not work out, as we know from many other different <laughs> subjects and libraries, etc. So we'll see yeah. how that plays out. But it's, it's good that there is definitely some and a lot of effort going on in the general C++ community at the moment to address this issue. And so I'm confident that something will come out of it that will be reasonably universal and accepted broadly. I find it funny that you mentioned that someone was already working on VC package because with my open source library, I got a, an issue a few months ago, or actually, I don't know how long ago it was now, that was basically like, well, the VC package is out of date. I'm like, the what is what what? I had no idea <laughs> that anyone had been working on it. I think it was before I was even really aware of VC package. It's kind of... They, they seem to be fairly aggressive in that community of getting as many packages in as they can. Yeah, and that's a, I suppose that's a, that's a good thing. Yeah. But it also does show up one of the perhaps um, less satisfactory aspect of open source. Sometimes you don't know who is using your libraries or whatever it is, your projects for what, and, and you're sitting there like wondering 
yeah, so do we have 100 people actively using it or 100,000? <laughs> and what are they doing with it? And of course, the peg till now, after 10 years of being public, we do have a sort of a certain stream of comments and, and feedback and even sometimes articles on the web that, that reference oh, yeah. it. Um, like there was one that we liked very much because it concluded with pectial rules. So that was a nice thing to read. But uh, we are very strict in wanting to keep the MIT license and be as liberal as possible, even though I have on occasion wondered, well, should we add a fourth clause? Like, yeah, everyone who uses this library has to send us a postcard stating uh, where they are and even just in very broad terms what they're using it for. A postcard with a uh, one euro coin. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that will go a long way, possibly. <laughs> yes. Uh, so I, I did notice Kling format configuration files and some of the repositories are you using that consistently across all of the code bases as well. Yes, we are actually using it. Um, while it's not so consistent formatting is not a priority. So it's not um, how would you say a first tier quality metric for code bases. We do think it is nice to have everything formatted consistently, and at least it prevents issues with you know. Uh, third-party contributions being formatted too differently and then having to discuss where the cutoff is. So, you know, we have the, the client format and we just use it and that settles that issue. It does seem like a good uh, way to manage user contributions if you're like, oh, they use tabs everywhere. Please apply the Clegg format file before submitting your patch or whatever. Yeah, and if somebody then doesn't do it or doesn't have client format installed, we just do it and, uh, you know, push another commit straight afterwards so that's that works well no problem do you ever find it gets in your way at all like uh, you intentionally wanted something to be formatted a particular way that goes outside of what cling format's capable of doing uh, we do actually have that in in the pectl in particular when you're writing grammars you often have these many lines defining all the different grammar rules one under each other where you have like struct your rule name, colon, and then the, the template expression that you are inheriting from. Right. And it really doesn't make any sense to put the curly braces from this struct definition into the next two lines. Right. So if you look into the PECTL source code, you'll see that in places where this happens uh, frequently, you'll have like a big block that is then in, uh, a big block of code that is excluded from the Clang format in order to keep the the formatting style that for this particular bit of code is is more appropriate. But I can I can one with that question say we are also using Clang tidy and that is actually giving us a few more issues, at least oh. in the in the JSON library. So in the PECTL we've only got I think about 10 places where we have a, a no lint comment to exclude a line from the Clang tidy. In the JSON library, which does uh, which throws a lot more exceptions, which does more low-level uh, fiddling around due to the um, union. We have like 400 places where we exclude the, the Clang tidy from, from giving a comment. And we are um, sort of at the moment looking into reducing the number of checks that Clang tidy does for us, which is quite a task since it's got a lot. Um, or we might even ditch it, but at the moment we're sort of trying to save the situation by cutting it down to a to a set of checks that works better for this particular project. Um, I recently became aware of a feature of Clang Tidy that I don't see used very often that might be helpful. That you can specify a .dot Clang Tidy file just like you can specify a .dot Clang Format file, so you can give like a top level project uh, exclusions. Uh, yeah, the the issue is that with 400 places, um, it's there are sort of also many different cases at times, and so okay. just the list of different checks that it has, we we have to you know dedicate some time just to understand the whole list and then try to choose wisely, okay, and um, figure out which ones just aren't appropriate for this particular project because it does a bit more low level stuff than than some other libraries usually do. Well, it sounds like you all have a lot going on with all these different projects. Yeah. Is there any other any projects that we have not discussed yet that you would like to bring up? Um, the I'd say the the three major libraries in Tau CPP are the PECTL, 
and the JSON library and also the Postgres library, which is a C++ wrapper around the libpq. That is also uh, very mature, even though uh, we might still need to uh, finish up on the documentation. That was one of uh, Daniel's private projects that he decided to, to share with the community. So for us, these are sort of the, the three poster child libraries, because as I mentioned, the other ones are a bit very specialized and perhaps not generally useful, whereas... Um, even though parsing and Postgres aren't perhaps something that you use in any project, they are, it's not something strange. You know, you, you might easily require a little parser. You might easily require a database. And JSON, of course, is everywhere nowadays. So that's right. generally of, hopefully, of a general appeal. Right. Sure. Cool. Well, it's been great having you on the show today, Colin. Uh, and obviously, we'll put links to uh, the libraries on the show notes. Is there anything else you wanted to let us know? Anything like where can people find you online? Um, yeah, you. I think you already mentioned the uh, GitHub page, and mm -hmm. you'll, as you say, you'll, you'll offer the link to everybody. Um, we don't have any blogs or, or such for, for our development. We try to uh, put every three minutes into the libraries themselves. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, so I just say thank you for having me. It was great talking to you. And I'll be looking forward to listening to your upcoming CPP casts. <laughs> Okay. Well, it's been great having you on the show. Thank you. Thanks for coming on. Yeah, yeah thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks so much for listening in as we chat about C++. I'd love to hear what you think of the podcast. Please let me know if we're discussing the stuff you're interested in. Or if you have a suggestion for a topic, I'd love to hear about that too. You can email all your thoughts to feedback at cppcast.com. I'd also appreciate if you like cppcast on Facebook and follow cppcast on Twitter. You can also follow me at Rob W. Irving and Jason at LeftKiss on Twitter. And of course, you can find all that info and the show notes on the podcast website at cppcast.com. Theme music for this episode is provided by podcastthemes.com. It's website at cppcast.com. Theme music for this episode is provided by podcastthemes.com.